you know, triathlons swim, bike, run, right? So if you are a pretty solid runner, um, you're probably a, a little bit of a whippet. And so I really like to add in a lot of hill work and strength work to those type of athletes um, because uh, they're probably a little bit weaker on the bike more than likely. That's just kind of the nature of most triathletes uh, coming from more of a run background or if they are a faster runner. Welcome to the I Race Like a Girl podcast, where a professional triathlete and an age grouper talk all things sport and life. We are here to educate and enlighten, but most importantly, to keep it real. We are your hosts, Amy Woods and Angela Nate. Let's race to it. Hey everyone, it's finally race season. Whether you are a week away from your first race of the season or a month or two away, we all share some of the same goals. And for many of us, me included, one goal is to get faster and stronger on the bike. While some of these tips are for the off season, there's lots you can do all year round to get you to that PR bike split we all keep reaching for. But I guess even when you get that PR, there's always room for improvement, right? Also, we do talk about strength training, and I wanted to let you know that if you use the code BESTRONG at amywoodsfitness.com, you can get the first month of my on-demand strength, stretch, and cycling workouts for only $10. There is a whole section in there for in-season strength training when you don't have a lot of time, but you know you need a bit of strength, balance, and functional fitness to keep you injury-free as the season goes on. I add new videos every week, too. That's amywoodsfitness.com and use the code BESTRONG. I'll put that in the show notes too. But before we dive in, we're going to hear from our sponsor, Inside Tracker, and then have a listen. Hey everyone, this episode is sponsored by Inside Tracker, a company actually founded not too far from us in Cambridge, Massachusetts. Angela and I both use their blood testing and analysis to make sure our bodies are optimized for the training we are doing. Whether you run, ride, hike, or swim, you understand what it means to push harder, reach farther, and go the extra mile. This relentless drive runs in your blood. That's why Inside Tracker provides you with a personalized plan to build endurance, boost energy, and optimize your health for the long haul. Created by leading scientists in aging genetics and biometrics, Inside Tracker analyzes your blood, DNA, and fitness tracking data to identify where you're optimized and where you're not. You'll get a daily action plan with personalized guidance on the right exercise, nutrition, and supplementation for your body. And when you connect Inside Tracker with your Fitbit or Garmin, you'll also unlock real-time recovery pro tips after you complete your workout. It's like having your own personal trainer and nutritionist in your pocket. For a limited time, you can get 20% off the entire Inside Tracker store. Just go to insidetracker.com forward slash I race like a girl. Hi, everybody, and welcome back to the I Race Like a Girl podcast. It is Amy and Angela, and we are back with an awesome podcast here on how to get stronger and faster on the bike with race season coming up. This is uh, a super important podcast. Uh, and But first, I need to ask you, Angela, how are you doing and where are you? <laughs> Well, I am in Lanzarote, Spain, which I've never been to Spain before. Um, Got here in 26 hours (laughs) from where I was in Vegas. So it was a long day, days. Um, And then when I got here, my bike didn't arrive. So there's always that stress. But uh, luckily, they found it. So it's coming. Um, But Lanzarote, if you've never been, is an island. And I haven't got to explore yet, but I'm pretty excited to tomorrow. But it's very similar to Kona is what I can see. Um, it's kind of a mix of Kona and Mexico is kind of how I would explain it right now. <laughs> and is it, it must be warm there. Yeah, it is. But it's not as warm as Kona where I'm at. Like it's, it's probably mm. like 80s maybe, I guess. So that's, um, nice. that's chilly compared to St. George. <laughs> yeah, and it's humid. And I, I truthfully love humidity. So... I yeah. just, I just love it. It feels so much better. <laughs> I 
I might be. I know. I know. Well, that's that's what we're used to. It, that dry St. Yeah. George air was brutal. Um, tell me how. So we are. We're recording this on Friday. So we're almost a week past race day, and you had a crazy long travel thing. How is your body recovering? You know, surprisingly, I feel really, really good. Um, I've done the back to back Ironmans like two weeks before. Um, and I was in Europe at the time when I did it and it was very similar. Um, I think the key is always like doing something right after the Ironman. So you and I went swimming cause you were down there and I kicked for about a K and I think that yeah. just kind of helped flush things out because, um, mm-hmm. I, I don't have any soreness at all. I ran today for 45 minutes. Um, I mean a little, little stretching I need, but that's just always, um, but otherwise I don't feel like I've done an Ironman, which is pretty fantastic, which I'm excited about, but, um, so yeah, I'm excited. So we'll see how it goes. That's awesome. Yeah. We'll see how it goes. Um, so we are here today to talk about how to get faster on the bike. Now you just did one of the hardest Ironman bikes uh, on the circuit and you're about to do Lanzarote, which I think is supposedly even harder than St. George. Am I right about that? Yeah. The bike course is supposed to be pretty gnarly. So I'm pretty excited about that one. (laughs) Yeah. And that's where I'm, I know. And that's where I'm going next. I feel like you are the perfect person to talk about how to get faster on the bike because uh, as a professional triathlete or just as an athlete, you are known to be a super strong bike rider. Uh, you know, you crushed gravel last year in your first year in gravel. And so I'm really excited to just dive into this topic. Um, so let's just talk about how to get faster on the bike. Let's think about what would be, let's just go through the like a list of some things that people can do. Let's talk about the first thing that comes to your mind when you, when someone says to you, like an athlete, look, I really need, I really want to get faster and stronger on the bike. Biggest thing is that huge base, all the miles you can get during winter months at a really easy, low aerobic pace. I've always believed that's, that's the foundation. Um, Some people kind of skip that and they go right into intervals and they, they never really get that, that base miles of like, months of base miles that I feel is needed to kind of sustain you throughout the season. Um, you know, that can be anywhere from eight to 12 weeks of just low aerobic work and, and, uh, just being consistent on it like and, four or five times a week of riding. Okay. And so, you know, we're talking low aerobic work, like for most people, like, you know, low zone two, we have zone one, um, low zone two kind of, just that fat burning kind of Mm -hmm. aerobic base. And is that, do you throw in during the winter? Of course we're coming out of winter, but that's okay. Uh, We can talk about this to see if people are like, Oh, I did that. Uh, (laughs) Do you throw in what kind of interval work? What kind of like heavy low cadence work do you do to mix it up? Mostly on the trainer, I assume. Right. Yeah. I mean, it all depends when your first race is, but Mm -hmm. my coach coaches me very, progressively and it's the way I coach my athletes too I I just I fully believe that you need at least two months of aerobic base where there is no there's no magic to it it's Mm -hmm. it's staying in your aerobic system um higher cadence like 80 to 90 uh I'm I tend to be a lower cadence person just naturally um but I try to make sure I maintain that higher cadence throughout those two months um and no real efforts in terms mm-hmm. of that. I mean, it's, it's a solid eight to 10 weeks of aerobic fitness. <laughs> and once you try to, and once you see that power increase and you kind of have that plateau happen, that's when you start putting in the interval work. Um, mm-hmm. you know, I always go into a little bit of strength work, which includes, um, lower cadence stuff on the bike as my, mm-hmm. as my intervals. Yeah. And I mean, I think was it last year when I was healthy, I watched, uh, oh, I think I watched all of Bridgerton during that time, <laughs> the first season of Bridgerton. And I think I get the to first, see that. And I think the first season of Cheer, although the second season of Cheer wasn't as good, you were not as into it when we were trying to watch it. But 
It was stressful at Daytona. I'm just letting you know. There's a lot of action going on. So that's where you can get the Netflix going because you can keep it kind of in the aerobic zone um, Mm -hmm. as opposed to maybe later, and we'll talk about this later when you're doing intervals, sometimes watching Netflix is hard to do because you're not paying attention, you know, to your heart rate or your power, um, and you can't zone out. All right. So long, you know, months, couple months of, you know, low aerobic building the foundation base. All right. What is the number two way to get stronger and faster on the bike? I mean, that's where you get more specific, I feel. I mean, I mean, for me, and again, there's many ways to skin a cat. So, uh, you know, your coach or philosophies may be a little different. But for me personally, and this is from my experience, having the foundation, bringing in the low cadence work, you know, two by 15 minutes, two by 30 minutes, three by 30 minutes, just lower cadence. And when I say lower cadence, it's 60 to 70 RPM. Depending if you're coming from an aerobic based athlete or an anaerobic based athlete so I usually do a 320 test on my athletes which is three minutes all out and then a rest and then 20 minutes all out and it not only gives me their threshold but it also tells me what kind of athlete they are so for example if your three minute all out effort is you know extreme powers I'm just gonna make Uranus numbers like 500 watts okay (laughs) and I mean that's that's pretty nutty (laughs) but I'm just saying I'm I'm trying to make it different So then your 20 minute power is say 150, like there's a huge discrepancy there. So that person really needs a lot of aerobic work. Like it's as basic as that. Whereas if you find someone like me, Mm -hmm. um, my three minute power and my 20 minute power are pretty close together. And so I still need that aerobic base, but it tells me as an athlete and my coach that I might need to work on a little bit more VO2 stuff. So one minute all out efforts or um, uh, one minute, really low cadence stuff with, with some recovery. And so it just depends where you are and what type of athlete you are. So in terms of that, you know, you can be doing low cadence work. You can be doing interval work, a huge base and component just to stay injury free, but also to bring in that speed is strength in the gym. Um, I tend to do eight to 12 weeks of that as well. However, there's a caveat to that. So when you do a lot of heavy, heavy strength work, speed is not going to be a part of that um, because the strength kind of downplays all the speed work. So again, it's, it's like building a house. So you have that huge aerobic base, you add in the strength work. So you have a, like a really strong foundation and then you slowly go up the, up to the tippy top of the, of the roof. And that's where you're going to find if you need um, the hard all out efforts or the lower cadence work to kind of really stabilize and make that house strong. Um, And then you can finally reach your peak, right? Um, I know this is kind of all cliche. No, no, it's it's great. I'm like, I'm listening because, and then I was like almost going to pause this so I could look up my three minute versus 20 minute power. I mean, I know what my 20 minute power is. And I think my three minute power is probably, I think it's like 30 to 40 watts more. So there is a difference, but it's not crazy. Mm. I do Mm -hmm. have a base. Uh, I just need to get, I think I just, I just need to learn how to hold power for longer. Um, in, in a race. But anyway, let's, I want to touch on that strength work. Cause as we know, I am very much into mm-hmm. strength and conditioning. And, um, of course there's the whole thing right now, especially for women where we need to lift heavy. Stacy Sims would really love us to lift heavy throughout the whole year. We triathletes mm-hmm. tend to periodize that and lift heavy in the winter and then go a little bit lighter, more balanced and strength body weight stuff in the on season. Um, but I really like to focus on the posterior chain, which I know you, we've talked about before, and the mm-hmm. core. Um, and so I do, you know, I do all, I'm all about like basic moves. Like you don't have to do anything crazy and wild to get a good strength session. You see all <laughs> these like crazy moves and I'm just like, oh my gosh, if you are not right next to a trainer doing some of those moves, you could be doing it wrong. Mm -hmm. So I love, as we've talked about, I love the single leg deadlift, deadlifts, love squats, backwards lunges, you know, hip thrusts. You've got, I love all of that. And then you've got the, besides your core stuff, you know, the renegade rows and rows and just some basic stuff. And I'll do that throughout the whole year anyway. 
uh, changing mm-hmm. the weight around. So, you know, posterior chain and core. So when you are on the long bike rides, you know, you're not getting fatigued. Uh, like your, uh, your core isn't, your back isn't hurting, things like that, which we'll talk about in a minute. Cause that could be other things that might not just be a, mm-hmm. a weaker core. Um, so I'm a huge fan of that and continuing it through the season. All right. So I had to pop in there with the strength training. <laughs> of course. Um, yeah. And the, about the posterior chain, like, I feel like, I mean, just to reemphasize that so, so much of what we do is all from, is all in your front of your body, know. you know, swimming, you know, we're in our arrow position running, we get all locked up into this kind of crouch position. So strengthening your back, strengthening um, your glutes, hamstrings, all that stuff, it kind of gets neglected in a way in what we do. So to make sure that all that balance is coming through so you can get the speed, I mean, I mean, that's massive right there. So yeah, for sure. Definitely. Um, okay. So we've touched on a few things. Let's keep going. Um, I want to ask you, and I will come back to some other things to some like training plans. So I really, I want to ask you about bike fit and arrow. Um, Mm -hmm. because I personally think there's like two camps here. One, especially like what I see on Instagram with the wind tunnels and like the tight fitting, um, tri kits and you've got the helmet, like every single thing to get that extra watt, like, and getting as low as you can on your arrow bars, (laughs) you know, and, and I understand you do get those extra watts, but on the other hand, if you can't hold that position and if it's uncomfortable or if you can't afford to get to a wind tunnel, like where is, what's, what's your thought, especially as a professional triathlete and a coach in terms of arrow and of course bike fit. Well, I'd probably know your thought on bike fit. (laughs) So I actually have been in a wind tunnel and Mm -hmm. I was positioned in a, in a position Mm -hmm. that was pretty arrow it gave me a lot of extra wattage but again I couldn't sustain it I felt so uncomfortable and Tim DeBoom I don't know if you guys remember him but he won Ironman twice and he was a Pearl Zumi athlete and he was there and he pulled me aside and said if you can't sustain that I mean this is pointless like um, and so he actually talked to the people in the wind tunnel and helped me find a really good bike fit which was fantastic Um, so comfort trumps I mean um, a lot of people like to have their elbows in because they think it's more arrow or it looks more arrow, but it restricts your breathing, especially as a male um, rides his bike. A lot of the times they have a really big upper chest. And so mm-hmm. the more wider you can put your elbows, the better. And you can actually get lower that way comparatively because you're not crunched up into a position that your body just won't allow you to because of your muscle mass or, or how you are as a person. Um, so again, comfort trumps, you have to be able to maintain that and sustain that. Um, with that said, you know, there are little tricks and stuff you can try. Um, you know, I just recently started reusing an arrow helmet. Um, I used it in St. George and the reason I didn't like them before is because the one I had had no vents to kind of help support any wind that was coming in. And I was so hot, but this new helmet I have was fantastic. Um, and obviously an aero helmet does help if you're in a really good position, uh, specific wheels can help. Um, a disc wheel, for example, can help yeah, you let's, cut through the wind. <laughs> I need to, let me stop you right here with that disc okay. wheel because, yeah. uh, I am obviously racing, uh, Barcelona, hopefully as soon as I'm healthy in, in October. And you're telling me, and my husband telling me you need to use the disc wheel and I am yes. terrified of using a disc wheel and because I'm worried about wind, I'm very, very light. And I have no idea if that matters or not. I feel like one gust of wind and I'll just be like off the bike course. So tell me about, talk about disc wheels. So it is a complete fallacy okay. that <laughs> <laughs> you can't use a disc wheel in wind. The wind actually makes it, I mean, the disc wheel in wind can actually make you more stable. Okay. And the reason being is because all your weight is on that part of your bike. Mm-hmm. And so it's stabilizing that bike. So if you, if you can think of a sail going in the wind, mm-hmm. if you can maintain and hold your bike, which 
we all can because that's where the weight of your body is. Right. And either lean into the wind slightly and you don't even have to think about it. It just happens. Um, you, you, you cruise so much faster and you're very, very stable. What causes issues in the wind is your front wheel. Mm -hmm. If, um, I, if you look at a lot of pro females setups, their, their front ends are very, very, um, small. Mm -hmm. So they're not really thick end. Um, you know, mine, I believe, is a C60, so it's 60 mils, um, which is not very thick. You know, some of the males can have more stability in the front end, so they go down to like a 90 or I don't even know how big. Mm -hmm. But the bigger um, your wheel is in the front, the more the wind catches it because your weight isn't all in the front. And so any type of gust of wind will unstabilize your front end, and that's where, you know, there's a lot of issues. I know disc wheels are not allowed in Kona um, because there are some pretty thick, thick gusts. And I don't know the history of that as, as well as I should, but I believe someone who had a disc crashed and it mm. wasn't a very good all, um, happenstance. So <laughs> I think they just decided no discs, but mm -hmm. in reality, a disc is something everyone in any race should use. Like right. that, and, that's my stance. <laughs> okay. I will commit if all is well to using a disc wheel in Barcelona, not to mention that I will look badass with a disc wheel, obviously. Oh my gosh, you will. Yeah. I will. And, and actually, if my new bike ever comes, yeah. if my new bike ever comes, uh, it'll be even better. Um, all right. Yes. You've heard it here first. And now that I've yes. said it out loud. And actually our friend out. Leah has my old disc. So if you need a disc, you can use well, that one. Well, and I think she is racing. She's racing Chatty in a week or when this comes out, it'll be yeah. you know, that coming week. And that's going to be her first race on a disc. Yeah. She's going to love it. Yeah. That's, I told her so, she's yeah. fast at 40. <laughs> fast at 40. All of us fast are. 40. Yeah, 40. Yep. Um, so that's another way to get some free speed. And let's go even further into bike fit. Now for everybody at home, I have ridden like on a trainer next to Angela and Angela will get off in the middle of a ride and like move her seat, like the tiniest bit or move, get out, put her cleat don't, in this thing. Don't, don't tell my coach. this. Okay. Your coach doesn't <laughs> listen to this. He's got bigger things to do, but you're always toying with it. And you're always yeah. looking at your cleat position. But I think that's amazing because I feel like you're the princess and the pea. Like you can tell when something is just a tiny bit off because you're so experienced on the bike. So um, let's talk about bike fit first for people who can't get to a bike fitter, whether it's price or uh, just they're not near a good bike fitter. And then what you kind of what a bike fitter can do. Okay, just going backtrack a little, I wouldn't say I'm a princess in tea because <laughs> if you knew who my coach was and how many bike fits we've done and like, can you look at this? Can you check this? He thinks I'm nuts. <laughs> but but However, that's because you're that, always searching yeah. for the best. Okay, maybe that's well, the wrong fairy tale. Yeah. <laughs> maybe I overthink things. However, I do have a very strong um, sense, I guess, of my bike seat. Like that's if it's I'm off, saying. like if. Like if I wear um, a thicker pad mm -hmm. of bike shorts or like a sh chamois, it just messes everything up. And maybe it's the feel of the seat. It could be anything. But um, my recommendation is don't do all these little finicky things unless, <laughs> unless you kind of know what you're doing. Um, and I would say that I'm half there um, because sometimes my coach just shakes his head at me. <laughs> However, the best thing for bike fits. So you really want to look at bike seat height um mm -hmm. there's actually some really good youtube videos yeah. on on this and a quick way which is kind of a, a um a, a sense i think it should work on most people is if you can sit on your bike seat and 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 just with your pedals um have your heels land on top of your pedals with a straight leg mm. then your seat height is good and then you put your then you put your uh cleats in position. And so you kind of have a little bit of an angle of your, of your knee. That's kind mm -hmm. of like a starting point. Mm -hmm. Um, but you really want to make sure your seat height is comfortable where you're not overextending your knee, your knee's not too short, your knee, your knee's not coming more forward than it should and causing pain. If you have pain in your knees, look at your seat height. 
The next, the next thing is the comfort in the front end. So you don't want to be too far forward. Uh, you really kind of want oh, just a little bit more than a 90 degree angle at your elbows. You're going to see a lot of people like their pads either on their forearms or on their elbows. More and more people are getting on their elbows. Ever since I started triathlon, I've always had them on my elbows. Um, I just found it so much more comfortable. In terms of hand position, either being hands really close or far away, that's more of a comfort thing. Um, for me, I really like my uh, elbow pads wider. Mm -hmm. um, I just feel so much more comfortable and I feel I can just like sink into my bike a little bit more. And then the last and final thought for feel, because I'm all about feel, is you want to feel like a crouching tiger. <laughs> I know that sounds stupid, but you want to feel like you can just pop out of the pop out of your bike. Mm -hmm. You don't want to feel like you're laid back or um your your seats too far back. You want to feel like you're using your glutes, you're using your quads, you're using your entire activation of your legs, and it feels like you can just like pop off your bike. That's that. That's the fit you want. That's the feel you want. So my tri bike is actually super comfortable. I love riding my tri bike. It feels like it fits me mm -hmm. like a glove. Does that mean I'm not a crouching tiger because it's too comfy? <laughs> no, I mean so. So for me, I find it really hard sometimes to 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 push myself on a road bike because the because because the position on a road bike and a TT bike are totally different. Yeah. And I just find it really hard for me because I'm so used to my TT bike because it's yeah. so comfortable to me. So I don't think that means that it, anything at all. But the next time you go on your TT bike, feel like you're on a, <laughs> like you're a crouching tiger. And see if totally, that's, gonna feel like <laughs> that's gonna be, that's gonna be my image. I have gotten three bike fits, uh, you know, yeah. to dial it in. And they did put me more in arrow the last time. Because my coach saw pictures from a previous race and he was like, you need to be more arrow. And I was like, but I'm so comfy, <laughs> but I'm still comfy. And so for a bike fit, um, obviously a lot of bike shops do that. Uh, we have some really mm -hmm. great local bike shops here um, in Cape Cod and in the Boston area. Um, what do you look for in a bike fitter? Someone with a lot of experience. I mean, obviously that that comes with it. Um, you know, it takes some time, but bike fitting, I like there's a lot of education and courses people can take, but I think a lot of it comes from experience from, mm. from the bike fitter. Um, I've had bike fits from kind of a standard bike fitter that was in a bike shop when I first started and it was great starting point. Um, and luckily for me, I had a coach back then that was a professional cyclist. And so he was really able to help bike fit me and he didn't have any of the education of the courses and stuff but his experience was able to show me which position so I think if you have a little bit of both um over the years I've had my bike fitter Brian Hughes at Fast Foots outside of Boston but then I always go back to my coach my coach is I mean you really have to trust in your coach mm -hmm. um above all else and with my coach I just believe in him whole Heartedly. So I, I, I mean, I get him to, to triple check my bike fit. Hey, well, what do you think of this? What do you think of that? So it just depends who's on your team, I guess, and, and really utilizing all of it to see what is most comfortable for you. Yeah. And I would say, you know, the, the bottom line is if you're having pain when you're riding, that isn't from a previous injury or your lower back is tight and all that jazz, um, definitely get the bike fit right away, especially if you're doing, well, any pain is not good, but especially once you get into long course, uh, 70.3 mm -hmm. and Ironman distance, uh, that is when you want to get a, a bike fit. You can kind of fudge it for a sprint and Olympic, um, if you can't afford that, but if you're looking at long course to get a bike fit, um, all right, let's talk about another way to get faster on the bike. And, uh, I have feelings about this. Let's talk about using power heart rate and mm -hmm. RPE and how you can use any of those or none of those to get faster and stronger on the bike. Yeah, I, I'm a huge proponent of using all three at the same time. And so perceived effort is always a huge, huge. Um, but then it, uh, the heart rate is a basic telltale sign of what your body's actually doing functionally. And power is, is what you're actually using on the bike. So being able to utilize all 
three of them is the best case scenario. When I race, I have my power, I have my heart rate, but I really do go by perceived effort almost 99% of the time. Mm -hmm. I like to have those numbers because subconsciously, I think it just kind of gives me, um, makes me feel like I know what I'm doing. (laughs) Yeah, yeah, yeah. And in that sense, it's like, I, like, I know what I can sustain for four or five hours and what's kind of an ideal power number for me. So seeing that number as I'm racing is, is kind of, um, supportive Mm -hmm. and same as heart rate. So if I saw a heart rate that was like 20 beats off, I, I know something's wrong with me, even though my perceived effort is like hard racing effort. So at that point, it makes me double check things like, okay, have I hydrated enough? Have I fueled enough? Um, maybe the heart rate's not reading right. So that's why I have the power as well. I've also had races where, you know, I wanted to use power and I got on my bike and it wasn't working. So having that backup is really, really good. And so yeah, that happened to me in Arizona. I had no power. Tell me, um, can we put that into specifics? I actually tell mm-hmm. me about, since it was only a week ago, if you remember mm-hmm. what your bike looked like at St. George power versus heart rate versus effort. And if you saw, if it was like, uh, always working, like dialed in what you thought it was, or if you had to adjust on the fly because of those metrics, do you remember? Yeah. Um, perceived effort wise was there, uh, power and heart rate were there as well. I mean, I was pretty solid throughout. Um, Mm -hmm. obviously there was descending and stuff. So you have to look at your normalized power. Um, but overall I think I did a pretty good job. Um, the one thing with Ironman is you don't want to go out too hard and that's how you get more speed on the bike as well is, is the ability to hold back a little bit at the, at the start of the, the race. And that's where, you know, perceived effort is super low and your power and heart rate could, uh, and your heart rate could be low and your power could be quite high. And so you have to really balance that out. So so let's say you average 150 Watts for your Ironman. Um, when you get off the swim and you're riding, it's going to feel easy. So, so going 175 Watts is not going to be, be that hard perceived effort wise, and your heart rate may still be a little low. Um, so But mentally, you know, and logically, you know that you can't sustain 175 watts for the entire five hours if you haven't really done that in training. Mm -hmm. So you have to look at all three parameters and and kind of check yourself, you know, before you wreck yourself. (laughs) That's a quote from a previous podcast. I know. Um, But I really like it. (laughs) So for me, I used all three metrics. Yeah. So you kind of have to really look at you know, your previous history of using it in training, what you, what you kind of game plan for racing and knowing that you can actually do that. Um, my power was a little bit low in this past race. Um, and, uh, I think part of that for me was the laps at around mile 80, uh, in an Ironman, you can't really do much harm at mile 80 if you try to go all out because you, you're just aerobically in the zone. So, mm-hmm that's where you want to push. Actually, you want to give it your a lot more effort at the back end of that race. And I kind of just settled in, there was no one around me. So I just kind of, <laughs> I look back and, and, you know, that's something that I wish I would have done. Um, but you know, yeah. this is for this next race. Yeah. But yeah. And you touch on that word pacing, which is another mm-hmm. way to get faster and stronger on the bike or in a race, which is what we're, the goal is that, you know, sticking to numbers, holding back in the beginning, especially long course, uh, Ironman, a little different pacing for 70.3, definitely different for sprint and Olympic, um, which maybe we should get into now. I mean, we have a lot of listeners who are just, who are sprint and Olympic distance, which I don't even want to say only, I say only in terms of distance because (laughs) sprint and (laughs) Olympics are so hard. You are just like, Oh, yes. All out, mm-hmm. especially a sprint. It's just fast and furious. It's like a time, you know, the time trial is crazy. And so let's think about how would you differ somebody's bike training who's training for a sprint or Olympic versus a half and a full? What? How would you help them get stronger on the bike for two Well, different- that's, yeah, that's where I believe interval work Mm -hmm. really is a huge, huge proponent. Um, I mean, you still need an aerobic base because sprints and Olympics are still aerobic, um, but Mm -hmm. you need the speed. And so that's where the specificity of 
speed work really can come into play and you have to balance that out. So instead of maybe doing a long ride on Saturdays, you would do more interval work. Um, you know, as a half Ironman and an Ironman athlete, we always have our long ride Saturdays of anywhere from three to seven hours. And you don't really need that um, all the time for um, an Olympic event. You know, you can go to three hours and then roll some intervals in there or sh- or shorten it up and do a little bit more bricks. Um, but for specific speed on the bike, I believe it does come with with specificity on what you're doing in the race. And so Olympics require more speed, uh, a little bit higher uh, power output and effort, and also heart rate. So you really want to sustain that uh, in training. Yeah. And when I first got into triathlon, like most people, you know, I just started with sprints and I came from mostly an indoor cycling background. Of course, I rode outside a little bit. And so a lot of my work was like threshold in VO2, just (laughs) going crazy on the spin bike. And I think (laughs) for better or worse, I was able to slide right into sprint distance races because I was like, oh, I know this effort. Uh, And Mm -hmm. of course now, you know, it's a little different uh, because I'm doing more long course, but that kind of stuff can really, really help. Uh, And Mm -hmm. so let's talk about now getting outside. Let's you, I want to, you do love the trainer. I am learning to love the trainer. Mm -hmm. You love riding inside, which is very good because we live in New England (laughs) and we spend a lot of time on the trainer. Um, However, you also have years and years of cycling experience under your belt um, and bike handling experience. And I think, you know, that people rely on the trainer a little bit too much. So let's talk Mm -hmm. about riding outside. (laughs) Um, what is your take on, I'm always my take. I'll tell you my take. I think that when the weather becomes good, you should be outside almost as much as possible as your schedule allows. Now, if you are working from eight in the morning to seven o'clock at night and you have to do a a. 5am trainer ride on a Wednesday, absolutely. But, um, when the weather warms up, Do you tell your athletes to get outside as much as possible or do you leave it up to them depending on their comfort level? Um, Well, I don't know about comfort level, but Mm -hmm. I do it out of ease of convenience. So a lot of my athletes have kids. Mm -hmm. A lot of my athletes have jobs that start quite early in the morning. And so it's not feasible for them to go ride at five at five in the morning when it's dark out. Right. I mean, I sure wouldn't. Um, Some people do, but I, I mean, I wouldn't personally. Um, so a little bit of is preference. Um, I do like to have kind of an ideal situation where if that's the case to do some indoor riding throughout the week yeah. and then doing a longer ride and the outdoor rides on the weekends when they have more time. For me personally, I mix it up. So um, I will still ride indoors outside uh, when it's really nice out um, because you can't beat indoor training. You can't beat uh, intervals that don't have any, any interruptions, you know, um, with that said, sometimes motivation is really hard inside. And I find that even just taking my bike outside and trying to find a road where I can do the intervals makes so much more sense. Um, and I can actually hit my numbers and and really try hard. Um, but I definitely mix it up. I, I've been known to ride inside still in the summer months. Um, and yeah, I mean, it's all what motivates the athlete in the yeah. end. I mean, if you're not very good technically at, at handling a bike, then you need more experience outside. I mean, 100%. You, no matter how many miles you do on an indoor trainer, you're not going to get that. Um, I don't have that issue. I mean, I feel like I can handle a bike pretty well. Um, but I do have athletes that, you know, they've hardly ridden outside and, and that's a huge component of safety. And it's also a huge component of being able to actually ride the bike hard and fast. So it just matters what uh, the experience level is as well. Yeah. I mean, I'm, I teach, I teach indoor cycling twice a week, so I'm inside twice a week, yeah. no matter what tomorrow is going to be a nice, gorgeous day. And I'm going to be teaching an 8am spin class, but I'm actually hoping to get on my bike after. Uh, but I, I guess maybe coming from an age group perspective, which is why I am here, 
uh, is I see a lot of erratic riding <laughs> um, in the <laughs> on the course in races. I try when I can to avoid aid stations on longer course stuff because there is some scary stuff going on at the aid stations. Uh, of course, sometimes you have to stop. Uh, I have seen, you know, just people not able to even get up hills, <laughs> things like that. And so I'm a big fan for regular folk of getting outside as much as possible, practicing drinking from your water bottle, practicing taking in nutrition, practicing mm-hmm. braking. <laughs> it's so crazy to me how sometimes <laughs> people don't even understand the braking and um, cornering, cor- like really being uh, able to corner on a bike. I'm so, I'm, I will say I'm very bad at cornering. <laughs> And this is somebody who rides mountain bikes and gravel bikes. And also just the elements. I actually make Mm -hmm. a point of going out when it's a little warmer. I won't go out like when it's like bitter cold, but I'll go out on a windy day or a day where it's maybe chances of rain just because you never know what you're going to get on race day. And, you know, I mean, if you look on any of the race, like Facebook boards before a race, besides water temperature and like whether there's going to be rain or not, nobody likes racing in their bikes in the rain, but like, it's all about wind and it's all about wind. And everybody's like, is it going to be windy? Mm-hmm. You know? And, you know, I just think like, even just your core engagement is different when you're out um, outside, mm-hmm. but you're right. I mean, I'm a big fan of indoor training. I do it twice a week on a spin bike, no less. And also sometimes I've been on my trainer a lot now because I've been injured. But as soon as that weather warms up, you know, get out on your bike. A tri bike is so different to get out on than a mountain bike, the body position. Um, Mm -hmm. and you know, gravel, I think we've talked about, we talked about this a long time ago, but I do think all of that gravel riding I did last summer and all those Hills, which we'll talk about in a second, really made my late season very, very strong. I felt really Mm -hmm. strong, um, from that gravel riding and that wasn't even on my tri bike. Um, so get outside, hmm. get off Zwift <laughs> for a little <laughs> bit. It'll be there. Your points will be there or your like neon mm-hmm. wheels. I don't know because I don't ride Zwift a lot. <laughs> I, I get, I get, uh, I get frustrated with the technology breakdowns <sighs> and the freezing and like the connection drops. So sometimes I'm just like, I can't handle it. Um, but anyway, so I want to talk about hills. Uh, I want to talk about, do I mean, how much hill work should we be doing to get stronger and faster on the bike? Well, hill work comes into play. It depends you again on, uh, I think, what type of athlete you are. Hill work really helps. So you also have to look at, you know, triathlon, swim, bike, run, right? Mm-hmm. So if you are a pretty solid runner, Mm-hmm. Um, you're probably a, a little bit of a whippet. And so I really like to add in a lot of hill work and strength work to those type of athletes um, because uh, they're probably a little bit weaker on the bike more than likely. Mm-hmm. That's just kind of the nature of most triathletes uh, coming from more of a run background or if they are a faster runner. Um, with that said, uh, I like to put in hill workouts and low cadence because if you're not near hills you can obviously still do low cadence stuff kind of as a a caveat before the speed work so big foundation strength work and part of that strength work is the hills and and or the low cadence that that can then transfer over into the speed work because you actually have the muscle mass and the ability to 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 get into the speed work um Someone that is a really high cadence, fast runner probably doesn't have a lot of the muscle mass required to really put out power on the bike sometimes. And so that's where the low cadence work will come into play Mm -hmm. and or hills. So that's me. (laughs) Yeah. For you, I think you need, you need to do a a lot of low cadence, heavy intervals is as I think would be your magic for sure. Yeah, I was doing that last year. I have not been able to do the heavy cadence. And guess what? 
I don't like low cadence work probably because it's hard. <laughs> well, yeah, because so. you're on your 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 spin bike going. I don't even know. I like I cannot sustain what like you do like 130 <laughs> RPM. It's nuts. <laughs> it's, I know. I was looking down it's in amazing. the last class. I was like, it was like 115, 120, and I'm telling the class, oh. let's go to that beat, and then I'm like, oh, they can't ride to that beat. That's wild. Yeah. <laughs> Um, and then well, so they to, can ride to the beat. They just skip a beat, like what I do. Yeah, that's true. That's so much fun. It's so different. It's so much fun. I don't even care. It is. Yeah. Um, yeah. So the last thing, and I'm gonna is uh, the probably like the most important way to get faster and stronger on the bike is also just to pick a kit that you look really good in. Because if you feel good, <laughs> you're gonna ride good. I swear. Dress the parts. <laughs> That's always my thing. It's like, if you can't be fast, then you just need to look good. So yeah, and I cannot to wait it. to wear, fake it to make it. I cannot wait to wear my new Erase Like a Girl kit out there. I got the new one and it's super bright. I was okay. just talking to a woman at our, at the race who we met and I said, oh, why did you join? Like I race like a girl. Like what? Sometimes I'm always like, how do people come to our team? And she said that she saw our kits on the race course at one of the races she did and she loved the colors and so she just started looking into that because our kits do stand out and uh, I was like oh that's so awesome I forgot to tell you so now I'm telling you and the world (laughs) well that's fun yeah so that was super fun all right well we are going to wrap this up I know it's actually kind of later at night for you uh in Lanzarote and uh This will come out this Sunday, so we still have a week before you race. So hopefully we will catch up before and um, and just, you know, get some rest. I hope your bike comes very soon and you get to go ride it and explore. Yes, thanks. I'm excited. All right. Yeah. All right. Awesome. Have a great day, everybody. Hey, everyone. Thanks for listening, and we hoped you enjoyed it. You can find us at amywoodsfitness.com and angelanath.com. We'd love to hear from you.